and the time scales of interest, the main source of the Earth's energy is the Sun, is huge when compared to the Earth and it is very, very far away. If we were to show both the scale on the screen, then we will have to reduce its size because of the distance between the two, which is literally speaking astronomical. Now the Earth's position can be pointed on the screen, though its size is just a little too small to be visible. It's right here. But when size to scale, it just about becomes invisible. So let's disregard the scale so that we can see both bodies, this the Earth and the Sun. We know from Stephen Boltzmann law that the black body emits radiation in proportion to the fourth power of its temperature in Kelvin, where sigma is a known constant. The Sun is not a black body, but based on what we observe, it can be viewed as a black body with an effective temperature of just under 6000 K. It emits enormous amount of radiation per unit time, but this energy dilutes with distance as it spreads. So by the time it reaches the Earth, it's a mere 1366 watts per meter squared. This is known as solar constant, though it isn't constant. It varies every minute and over time, but the variation over the time scales of interest to us is not too big, so we can view it as a constant. Now, as we mentioned earlier, the Sun is much larger and far, far away. So one can assume that the radiation reaches the Earth as a parallel rays. We will ignore the atmosphere, but will introduce it in a bit. If you were standing on the side of the Earth, not facing the Sun, you will see a dark circle. So the Earth is intercepting this portion of the Sun's radiation, which is S0 per unit area times the area of the circle, with R underscore E representing the radius of the Earth. It reflects a proportion of the incident light, which we represent by alpha, so it absorbs 1 minus alpha times the intercepted light. Now the Earth will also emit some energy, but it emits energy in all directions. So the area of the emission is the whole area of the sphere, which is 4 times the area of the circle. And assuming an equivalent black body temperature of T underscore E, the Earth emits sigma times T underscore E to the power 4. This is per unit area, right? For equilibrium to exist, the incoming and outgoing radiation must be equal. We can cancel the pi times R squared and then isolate T underscore E on one side. If we assume alpha equals 33%, meaning the Earth absorbs 67% of the incident light, then we find that this temperature equals 252 Kelvin, which is minus 21 degree centigrade. Oh, cooler than freezing, eh? We know it isn't correct though. The planet, as we know, is a lot warmer. So what have we missed? We haven't accounted for the atmosphere. For simplicity, let's assume just one homogeneous layer of atmosphere. The story is the same, just the details differ. The solar constant arrives from the space, but now has to go through the atmosphere which absorbs a fraction of the light and transmits a proportion tau underscore s of the incident light to the surface. The surface also emits the same energy we saw before. However, as for the sun energy, it has to go through the atmosphere now, which absorbs a fraction and transmits a proportion tau underscore e of the emission to space. There is an additional transfer from Earth to the atmosphere in the form of the evaporation and convection. 
which is the sensible heat. This has a complicated dependence on many factors but we are interested in the current condition so we can assume it is a constant. The atmosphere will also emit. If it were a black body then we know it will emit sigma times the fourth power of its temperature but it isn't a black body so let's assume it emits a proportion of the black body with the similar temperature. It will emit both ways. As the top and the bottom of the atmosphere have different temperatures, the emissions in the two directions will be different, which we capture by applying different factors to the upper and lower emissions. Notice we ignored the differences due to the differences in the areas of the two sides because the atmosphere is very thin in relation to the radius of the earth. We now focus on the exchanges that the atmosphere makes with the space and the earth. So let's straighten things. At equilibrium, the sum of the outflows to the space must equal the inflows from the space. And similarly, the sum of outflows to the earth will equal the inflows from the earth. That give us two equations for two unknowns. If you solve it for T underscore E, then you will get this very simple but complicated looking expression. And similarly, solving it for T underscore A will produce a very similar result. Now let's try some rough values of the parameters. The atmosphere transmits most of the solar light, so we assume that tau underscore S is equal to 77%. On the other hand, it absorbs most of the radiation from the Earth, so we can set the value of tau underscore E equal to 10%. For beta, we make use of Kirchhoff law and say that since the atmosphere absorbs 90% of the long wave radiation, this the radiation from the Earth, its transmission is also equal to 90%. Since the lower part of the atmosphere has higher temperature, we assume L is equal to 1.4 and the upper part is cooler or thinner, so we assume U is equal to 0.8. Roughly speaking, 36% of the emission from the atmosphere is upward with the remaining 64% downwards and H is roughly equal to 100. Also, Alpha stays at 33% as most of the reflection happens from the atmosphere anyways. If you plug in these values into the two expressions, you will get 291 Kelvin for T underscore E, which is 18 degrees centigrade, close to the average surface temperature of 15 degree. And for the atmosphere, we get 261K, which is minus 12 degrees. Again, close to the average temperature of the material part of the atmosphere. So the atmosphere does the magic. It lets the energy from the sun, but traps the heat from the earth, keeping the planet warm. What is it in the atmosphere that does this magic? As we shall see, it is a few of the trace gases such as water buffer, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrogen oxide etc and due to the similarity of their effect with that from the greenhouses they're called greenhouse gases we shall explore these topics in a lot more detail in the future videos thanks for watching and i look forward to seeing you in the next